What's up designers and welcome back to Rempton Games. In today's installment of History of Game Design, I want to take a look at one of the most influential and innovative games of all time, Dungeons and Dragons. Since its debut nearly 50 years ago, Dungeons and Dragons has influenced and inspired countless games and has also had a major influence on the fantasy genre as a whole. While this game has far too much history to truly cover it all in a single installment, today I want to look at the origins of the first edition, briefly look at how the game has evolved over time, and see how its mechanics have influenced modern game design. Without further ado, let's get started. While games that simulate warfare have been around for thousands of years, the modern concept of a war game as a highly detailed, dense strategy game goes back to a game known as Tactics, published by Avalon Hill in 1954. Throughout the 50s and 60s, war games steadily grew in popularity, to the point that groups and societies dedicated to this hobby began to pop up. One of these groups was the International Federation of Wargaming, or IFW, founded by Bill Spear, Gary Gygax, and Scott Duncan in 1967. This group was not only dedicated to playing war games, but about spreading information, encouraging publishing, and bringing people together. It published fan magazines that it distributed to its members, and it also held conventions such as the Lake Geneva Wargaming Convention, better known today as Gen Con. This organization was also made up of several smaller groups that were dedicated to specific areas of wargaming, such as the Armored Operations Society, which was focused on World War II gaming. One of these subgroups was the Castle and Crusade Society, founded by Gygax and Rob Kuntz. This group was dedicated to medieval miniature wargaming. It was in a small newsletter for this group, known as the Domesday Book, that Gygax originally published his set of rules for medieval miniatures. Although the circulation of this magazine was small, it nonetheless caught the eye of Gaidon Games, which hired Gygax to produce a series of war games with miniatures. Among these games was Chainmail, published in 1971, which was largely based on the medieval miniature rules published in the Domesday Book with some help from hobby shop owner Jeff Perren. Chainmail was an expansion of these rules, and consisted of four parts. The first section was rules for massive military battles, with each miniature representing 20 units and containing rules for things like artillery, terrain, and how infantry units interacted with cavalry. The second section was rules for one-on-one -on -one combat, and the third section was rules for jousting. The fourth was a small appendix on how to add fantasy features to the game, introducing things such as elemental creatures and magical spells. A few years earlier, in 1967, Dave Wesley developed an experimental new form of war game which he called Bronstein. This game, which took place in a fictional German town of the same name, was set during the Napoleonic Wars. Unlike most war games at the time, which had players controlling armies of soldiers on opposite sides of the battle, Bronstein had players controlling individual characters. Some players might have roles such as military commanders, while others might be the town mayor, for example. In addition, this game took inspiration from a wargaming book from the late 1800s known as Strategos. Strategos allowed players to basically attempt any action, and if that action was not covered by the rules of the game, the outcome would be determined by a referee. Wesley took these concepts and applied them to individual characters instead of military units. While it may simply have been a goofy experiment at the time, the concept of giving each player a player character with a unique history and personality that can carry over from game to game was revolutionary. This idea was expanded on by many of Wesley's gaming buddies, most notably Dave Arneson, who applied the concept of a player character to a Tolkien-inspired fantasy world known as Blackmoor. In these Blackmoor games, Dave Arneson began using the chainmail system for combat, 
but also added his own additions such as character classes and experience points. By 1971, Gary Gygax was already working at Gaidon Games, and he began collaborating with Dave Arneson on an idea for a brand new game, a Napoleonic warship game known as Don't Give Up the Ship, which was published in 1972. Sometime after working on Don't Give Up the Ship, Arneson introduced Gygax to his Blackmoor games, and the two began collaborating on a new game, a game that would soon come to be known as Dungeons & Dragons. This early edition of Dungeons & Dragons built on concepts from both creators. It used a combat system derived from Chainmail, as well as the player character and referee systems created by the Bronstein games, and concepts such as armor classes and level systems that were introduced by Arneson in his Blackmoor games. It also played into the fantasy aspects that were briefly touched upon in the Chainmail Appendix, creating a vast fantasy world that was heavily inspired by authors such as J.R.R. Tolkien and H.P. Lovecraft. Designing a game is one thing, getting it published was another, and Arneson and Gygax had quite a difficult time. Perhaps because their game was so unusual and experimental for the time, it was impossible for them to find a publisher to publish it for them, and they ended up having to do it themselves. This required starting a new company, Tactical Studies Rules, better known as TSR. Dungeons & Dragons would be TSR's first game, and would have to be published on a very tight budget. Because of this, the designers had to find ways to limit their expenses, such as by hiring their friends to do artwork at a few dollars apiece. Despite all these difficulties, however, the first edition of Dungeons & Dragons was finally published in 1974. This early version of D&D is quite primitive from our modern perspective. It had only a handful of playable races and classes, and it wasn't really even a standalone game. It expected that players already owned a copy of Chainmail, as well as an Avalon Hill game known as Outdoor Survival. This first edition was pretty rough and didn't take off right away. Only a thousand copies were sold in the first year, with another 3,000 being sold the year after that. However, in 1975, the growth of D&D began to accelerate. New expansions were created based on the popular campaign settings of Greyhawk and Blackmoor, and the D&D fan community began to grow with the publishing of the first D&D magazines. In 1977, D&D had its first major change, being split into two separate products. The first was Basic D&D, which was basically a cleaned up version of the first edition that was designed to be more friendly to newer players. The second product was a more structured rule system known as Advanced Dungeons & Dragons. This version introduced the three core rulebooks of the Player's Handbook, the Dungeon Master's Guide, and the Monster Manual. Throughout the 70s and 80s, these two forms of Dungeons & Dragons evolved separately, each receiving their own expansions and revisions. However, the next major change didn't occur until 1989, with the creation of Advanced Dungeons & Dragons 2nd Edition. In addition to revising the rules, 2nd Edition also removed some of the more controversial aspects of Dungeons & Dragons in response to the Satanic Panic of the 1980s. Mazes and Monsters is a far-out game. Swords, poison, spells, battles, maiming, killing... Hey, it's all imagination. Is it? The third version of Advanced Dungeons & Dragons was released in 2000, and simply went by the name Dungeons & Dragons 3rd Edition since the basic version had since been discontinued. This version had a much more unified rule set, which focused around resolving actions by rolling a 20-sided die known as a d20. In addition to forming the new rules for D&D, 3rd Edition also was the foundation for the d20 system, an open license rule set that allowed players to build their own RPGs based on the 3rd edition rules. Further revisions of the basic rule set would come with 4th edition in 2008, and 5th edition, also known as D&D Next, in 
in 2014. The fifth edition was noteworthy not only because it's the current version, but also because it's the first version of D&D to rely on public playtesting, having received feedback from over 75,000 playtesters. It's hard to overstate just how much the gaming industry owes to Dungeons & Dragons. To begin with, it introduced the entire modern concept of a role-playing game, which didn't really exist outside of the developer's local playtesting groups at the time. Role-playing games, or RPGs, have since expanded to be a staple genre in the gaming industry that not only includes tabletop role-playing games like Dungeons & Dragons, but also digital RPGs such as the Final Fantasy and Pokemon series, and even live-action role-playing games known as LARPs. Prior to D&D, wargamers generally took the role of military companies, units, and vehicles, but never really controlled a specific character. The idea of a one-to-one -one correspondence between player and character was not entirely new. For example, the game Clue had each player representing a specific character, and that was published over 25 years earlier, in 1949. The difference, however, was twofold. First, in previous games, the character that you chose didn't really affect how you played in the game. Second, in D&D, your character can carry over through multiple play sessions and remembers the events of the previous sessions. This allows players to spend a lot of time refining the backstory and personality of their characters. This ties into another innovation of Dungeons & Dragons, the concept of a campaign. While war games could get quite long, they were also generally self-contained. This was not the case for D&D, in which multiple different adventures could be strung together with the same characters. The potential for endless adventures also allowed dungeon masters to create huge, complex, detailed, and realistic worlds for their players to inhabit. Speaking of dungeon masters, the idea of using a referee to determine the outcome of different actions was another major mechanical innovation, because it allowed the players an unprecedented amount of freedom. Players were no longer required to stay within the sharp boundaries created by the rulebook, but were allowed to attempt any action that they could think of. The only limitations were their own creativity and the Dungeon Master's generosity. While these big ideas helped form the core of the role-playing experience, the smaller mechanical ideas in D&D have been equally influential. Character classes, for example, can be found in countless RPGs, and many of these games not only copy the idea of character classes, but also use many of the same classes that are used in Dungeons & Dragons. While the first edition only had three possible classes for your character, the cleric, the fighting man, and the magic user, later editions refined and expanded these possibilities, creating such classic classes as paladins, thieves, and bards, which can be found in uncountable numbers of games. The concepts of levels and experience points can also be found everywhere in the modern world, and not just in games. While these concepts can be found in countless games, they also form the foundation of the entire concept of gamification, which is basically the idea of trying to apply game design concepts to real-world activities. Almost always, this involves giving the player experience points for doing the activity and allowing them to level up when they have enough experience points. These concepts are so popular and well-known that they're often taken for granted, but D&D was the first to use these mechanics in the way we know them today. However, D&D is not only influential from a game design perspective, but also had a huge influence on the entire fantasy genre. The races, magical items, settings, and magic system of D&D have probably influenced more books, films, and TV series than any other fantasy source other than The Lord of the Rings. The entire genre of isekai anime basically owes its existence to Dungeons and & Dragons, and the fantasy concepts introduced in this game can be found in everything from Rick and Morty to Pixar's Onward. However, digging into all of the ways that modern culture references Dungeons & Dragons is a huge topic, and could easily be its own video, so that's where I'm gonna leave it for now.
That's all I have for today. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, please leave a like and subscribe so you don't miss more videos like this in the future. If you want to see more, you should check out my previous entries in the History of Game Design series. I'll put a link in the description down below to the playlist. If you have any games or genres that you think should be highlighted in future entries, please let me know in the comments down below. And join me next time for part 4 of my ongoing Evolution of Pokemon design series. Until then, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you all next time.